Thanks, boys and girls of all ages. Uh, I'm going to zip through this. It's uh, pretty basic, probably for most of you, uh, but still fairly important. And one of the uh, titles of this talk that might be, instead of public opinion, friend or foe, which is a very philosophical way to start, uh, the uses and abuses of opinion polls. Because, my God, are there a lot of them, uh, particularly the abuses. Now, go back to 2010, because this is what came up at 10 o'clock at night on Big Ben, on the building in which the clock Big Ben exists. And it showed what, uh, what was there. Now, what ensued that evening, I was standing just across the, the, the river uh, in the ITN, and then I went down to the BBC boat and was interviewed down there. And uh, I got a lot of stick that evening uh, in 2010 because the collective judgment of the media, the journalists, was, that's rubbish. That can't possibly be the case. The Liberal Democrats down there and the Tories like that, uh, not what nonsense, and everybody was saying that. Ian Dale's on LBC these days, but he's a publisher, published three of my books uh, called Politicos. He used to own a bookstore called Politicos, which was the best political bookstore I've ever been in uh, that, was, that was just dedicated to it, and the staff were very knowledgeable. You'd always run into people there that uh, were either members of parliament or former members of parliament or uh, senior civil servants, whatever. They were political junkies, like uh, I certainly am, and I know some of the faculty are, and probably I hope some of the kids are. But Ian Dale said, if the exit poll is right, I'll run naked down Whitehall. Well, that's a pretty good promise. This year it was, if the exit polls are right, uh, this was Patty Ashdown, I'll eat my hat. So uh, he was called on it, and uh, so he said, well, he wanted a marzipan hat, and he duly ate it. Uh, but I thought it was a bit of a cheat. I would have given him a fedora, I think, uh, that was cloth. So at midnight, I'm being interviewed by uh, Martin Lewis, and uh, he said, uh, Bob, uh, I'm afraid I just cannot uh, agree that uh, that poll can possibly be right. And I said, well... Uh, I can remember you almost precisely five years ago at almost precisely the same time seeing exactly the same thing. So my advice is wait and see. So at 3 a.m., and I'm still up working, m people were saying, everybody in the media, my God, it might be right after all. And then at 6 a.m., well, what do you know? It is right. And that was what happened. It didn't happen this time. But I will be talking uh, in a minute about explaining Cameron's comeback. But there's a few points I wanted you to know. Oh yes, Ian Dale then, when I challenged him, hey, when's it gonna be? I've got my camera ready. He said, well, I didn't say when. He's still saying, I didn't say when. Uh, but on that occasion, it was 307, 306, 255, 258, 59, 57, an overall majority, minus 19 or minus 20. And that has been uh, something that's uh, kept me going for a lot of stick and, and trouble about the, uh, not about the exit poll, because the exit poll was very close this time, but the preliminary work, and I've got a slide on that later. So rubbish, everybody. If the exit poll right as might as well be a narrow majority for the Tories, 11 p.m. And by the way, our poll five days before the election was a 3% Tory lead. And it was six, so it was a bit closer on the lead. And I said at midnight, let's wait and see. And I didn't say, uh, my God, it might be right. Though the exit poll was right. Uh, and the following week, it was just a avalanche of, well, so the polls got it wrong again. Some did, some didn't. And what we did get almost precisely was the SNP in Scotland. The headline on our poll in Scotland was it could be a, a clean sweep, all 59 seats, and we were out three seats because it was 56 seats. We also got the Liberal Democrats spot on. Also, we were within a point or two of UKIP and the like. But the thing that pollsters get wrong, if they do get it wrong, is calling the wrong winner. 
Now, when John Major got his narrow majority, it was 21, and that was unworkable within about a year. Uh, the, if you discount the uh, speaker, uh, you've got a 10 or 11 seat majority, not, not even the 12 that mathematically it is. Now, I want to just briefly, and I promise briefly, talk about what is public opinion, the importance of it, what pollsters actually do, what journalists and others want polls to do, which is forecast the future. And I, what I say is, we don't gaze into crystal balls, we don't read tea leaves, we're not really forecasters. That's for pundits to do, but journalists insist that the polls that are done the previous week have got to be a forecast and too many pollsters cave in, and it's nonsense. Dealing with journalists and editors is a real challenge. It's a very simple business, actually. It's, our, it's a slide that's coming up. What is it? The uh, Oxford International Dictionary says uh, in 835 words or thereabout what it is, and I just sum it up by saying it's the collective view of a defined population, whether it's students at Warwick as a defined population, and that can even be tricky. When I was lecturing on this at LSC, I was pointing out that so many of the LSE students live off campus and many of them, particularly the postgrads, and it's heavily postgraduate weighted at LSE, uh, aren't around this semester, or sorry, this term, slipping into the American vernacular and the like. But if you can, if you can define a population very clearly, when I was teaching at City University to the Graduate Center of Journalism and trying to get some of this stuff across for 12 years, and failing. I found that uh, when I ask uh, simple questions, which I did before every class, I did a five question uh, pop quiz and everybody seemed to like it, but the faculty were saying, my God, how do you get away with that? I said, well, it's because you're not paying me uh, to do this. I don't have to do it. So uh, they, they pretend to cooperate, the students, but ma at master's level. They were a good group normally. And I did that for 12 years, as I say. Uh, and uh, I'd ask people that question, how do you define a defined population? And they were all over, journalists were all over the place. There was another lecture I was giving that the last election, 2010, invited over to the BBC's College of Journalism to talk to 41 of the 50 or so senior executives at the BBC, including the uh, director general, and uh, three, I think, of the five managing directors, I think they're called. And I use the phrase swing. I'll ask you the question I asked them. How many can define swing? You can't. Do you know the formula? Do you know how to calculate it? I would expect in this group more than the 41 in the BBC, at least one. Nobody? Do you not have any empirical? You, can you do it? Uh, my guess would be it's the previous election result minus the current poll, and then you take away at each constituency the difference between the previous election result and the current polling. You, le you left a very important thing out of the simplest equation I know. You divide by two. You're quite right, but you divide by two. Why do you divide by two? Because if I'm over here as labor, and I switched to the conservatives. I've taken one away from labor and I've added one to the conservatives. So you have to divide by two. That's all it is. It's the simplest equation. So I said to them, how many of you, when I was su very surprised that so few, because they use swing all the time and they don't know what they're talking about. And I uh, t told them how to define it. And I said, how many of you have studied statistics, economics, econometrics, any science, medicine, astronomy, physics, chemistry, anything else, anything numerate of the 41, one person. It was the science editor. He was the only one that had studied science in that whole group of humani humanities and languages and the like. So it's a problem we have. Now an opinion poll is nothing more than exactly the same thing with the added bracket of a representative sample of defined population at a point in time. And this business about forecasting that we have hung around our necks is because people forget, even though we keep saying 
An opinion poll is only as accurate as the day it was taken in the field work, not the date it was published. And you get journalists all the time saying it was published last Tuesday and drawing the conclusion, and this has literally happened in major national newspapers, where they've said there's been a swing to the Tories when all that happened was that they got the dates wrong of the field work. So it's at the date of the field work that you want to know. And there are five things that you do want to know if you're a journalist or a political scientist or doing a paper on this. And that is the name of the company who did it, <clears throat> the dates that it was done, the methodology, the size of the sample, and if there's anything different about it than went before. If a question has been, well, you want to know the precise wording of the question, and if it's a trend question, you want to, you want to know if it's different than before. Uh, what is public opinion? Plato out of view. Opinion is more obscure than knowledge, but clearer than ignorance. Very good. I haven't been able to improve on that. Uh, did Rousseau, just as an architect before erecting great edifice, observes and sounds out the ground to see if it can support the weight the wise legislator does not begin by drawing up laws by which are good in themselves, but first investigates whether the people for whom they are intended is capable of bearing them. Long, but boy, it's uh, imaginative and uh, sums up that uh, legislators, and I am not a believer in a management by opinion poll, either in my own company or in government. It's supposed to improve the decision making of the legislature or the executive that are making laws, the legislator. Describing it, it's an aggregation of individual views. It reflects a majority, but it also reflects minority views. And too often the journalists own, are really only interested in reporting the majority or the difference. And you really, I believe, owe it to your public that you have a responsibility to for making sure that minority views are represented. It's found in a clash of group interests, which we call activated public opinion. It's media and elite opinions, as well as uh, public opinion, which are representative samples. Public opinion has power, but of course it's a fiction. We don't know it, we can't feel it, we can't touch it. My strong belief is that it should rest on public opinion, but guide, not determine policy. It's a safeguard against tyranny. Tony Benn, the late Tony Benn, at the time of the Falklands War, stood up in Parliament the day before our poll in The Economist came out, waving a sheaf of uh, 20 or so letters, it looked like, saying public opinion is swinging massively against the war, meaning the Falklands War. The next day, we found 78%, I think, of the British public, it was that were in favor of sending the Falkland uh, task force to free the Falkland Islands. So, you know, he's, he was a demagogue and he was a cheerf very cheerful and very courteous demagogue, but a demagogue nonetheless. It can be mobilized, again, active, activated public opinion, provides clues about culture, and the question is, is it vox populi, vox dio? Well, the voice of the people is the voice of God? That was assumed by, who was it, Aristotle? Plato, and uh, my son would tell, tell us he, he teaches uh, in, uh, in New York, and he teaches Plato, and I said, he teaches Plato's Republic, and I said to him a year or so ago, why don't you teach all of Plato if you've got 13 hours to do it in? He said, you can't cover the Republic in 13 hours. Well, he's at the other end of the spectrum from me, of course. The Latin saying goes, vox populi, vox dei. The voice of the people is supposed to be equal to the voice of God. Public opinion is believed to be ignorant, vulgar person who reproves everyone and talks most of what he understands least. That's Hegel, quoting, quoting uh, Aristo. McKinnon, name you've never heard of, in 1828 wrote a fantastically interesting book called Public Opinion. Three requisites, wealth, enough money to live beyond substance, subsistence, and to be able to consider what we spend our lives doing, teaching and learning, and uh, to have the privilege of being in the 99th percentile 
uh, or the top 1% of the people in the world, most of whom live lives of quiet desperation. Communication beyond the village and moral principle, people's values. And when I lecture about Magna Carta, I tell them the story of it, 1957, arriving in this country and going first morning, first thing, to the British Museum to see two things, the Magna Carta and the Rosetta Stone, because to me the rule of law and communications are the essence of civilization, a civilized country or a civilized world. Policy and democracy should rest on informed public opinion. It's a simple <coughs> task. It's a marriage of the art of asking questions and the science of sampling. All you have to do is ask the right questions of the right sample, add up the figures correctly and report them knowledgeably and accurately. And the fourth one's the real toughie, dealing with journalists. Making sure that they're doing it right instead of what the editor wants them to do or the publisher wants them to do. We measure perceptions, not facts. Five things we measure with the tools of our trade. People's behavior, their knowledge, but also their views. And I divide views into three levels, rather too poetically for academic adoption their opinions, their attitudes, and their values. Click, click, click. Uh, the opinions are lightly, well, here it is. Uh, I use the C to describe what I'm saying. Opinions are the froth on the surface of the public. Mind or mood or attitude. Uh, attitudes are the currents, not current, yeah, the currents below the surfaces. Their values are the deep tides underneath that ocean. And they say that a picture is, uh, if you got 80 per, you can get 80% with pictures and you're lucky if you get 40% with words. So think of that. When you think of looking at empirical data, quantitative research findings, or even, even subjective uh, qualitative research in your work, that you are looking at whether or not it's an opinion, lightly held, easily changed, easily blown about by the winds of the political noise or the media or social media. Their attitudes, and I, when I give lectures at, uh, or speeches at the three-party conferences, as I'll be doing uh, in September, October uh, this year, as I do every year, <coughs> a fringe meeting, 150, 200 people there, usually, and I say, because a lot of them are local counselors, and uh, what I say is, you want to change an opinion into an attitude? forget to collect the rubbish. That'll really move from being an opinion to an attitude and it's not going to do you any good. Or not changing a street light that's out. Uh, I learned that one in Trinidad when I was working for the Prime Minister of Trinidad for 12 years, two different Prime Ministers, and uh, they took this to heart and really thought about it. And uh, uh, in a qualitative research uh, exercise, a focus group, I didn't run it myself because a trainee has to run them, but working for me, <coughs> she came up with one person who said, if they could just get the street light fixed in our street, crime and vandalism would disappear. And crime's the biggest issue in, in politics in, in Trinidad. So the deputy prime minister and I went to see the advertising agency on the Wednesday afternoon uh, with, the, with the quantification that we'd done that day and on Thursday they came up with the ad and on Friday morning it was in the three main papers that served the country and we had our meeting at 11 o'clock with the Prime Minister that day <coughs> and he had the three papers open to the ad for the People's National Movement, PNM. And he said, where did this come from? And uh, Lenny said, uh, oh well, we didn't see the agency. Bob's uh, focus group came up with this idea and we tested it yesterday and it's number one on the list of people's uh, views about how sol solving the problem of crime. And uh, he said that uh, they thought this was a winner. And uh, so we decided to, to put it in the ad. Here's the PNM solution. And he said, yeah, uh, yeah, I understand all that, but why 48,000 new street lights? And Lenny said, the advertising agency said 50. And I said, no, 48,000 sounds a lot better. Now, I can rarely get prime ministers and presidents that I've worked for to do what I think is a good idea, I have to confess. 
it's a frustrating job because they've got so many other pressures on them. Uh, but they delivered 118,000 streetlights over the next five years. And I was really proud of them, and it did make, did make a difference to crime. Not enough, but it did. Right when I first got started in this country, the bureau chief of the U.S. News and World Report had us over for dinner. And uh, his wife said, there was eight people at the dinner table, all in the kind of media and all that. And she said innocently, uh, why do you bother with these uh, going to such difficulty uh, in selecting your samples? Why don't you just put an ad in the Times and let people write in and say that they'd like to, like to help you with your question? And, uh, and her husband was just going like this. And uh, I said, well, uh, that would take care of about 2% of the electorate. What about the other 98%? Well, oh, everybody I know reads the Times was her answer, and she was serious, and she worked at ITN. God. More than 11,000 full-time undergraduates gave their views on every aspect of university life, so on and so forth. The results were used to decide that 2009 Times Higher Education Award for the most improved student experience went to Queen Mary, according to the tables. I calculated, no, it had, it had reported that Queen Mary went from 82nd, everybody knows the National Student Survey, Right? We've done it since its inception, one of my big samples uh, st surveys. Uh, went in one year from 82nd to 51st. So I've never gone public on this, but it said the calculation is based on two sets of responses. The score for Queen Mary was based on 141 responses to an online survey. What it didn't say is the 141 were from a student body of 15,000 with a score of 75.2. Statistical reliability of 150 perfectly randomly selected students compared with the same numbers in the prior year would be plus or minus 12 point, minus 12, 95 times in 100. In other words, 19 times out of 100, it, it would rank between first and 100. God, you know, why, don't people, why, don't, why doesn't the Times higher understand enough statistics to understand that? Okay, let's talk uh, EU referendum. Okay, Hugo Young, the late political editor of uh, the Sunday Times, great man. He was my predecessor as a visiting, no, as a professor at City University in the Graduate Center of Journalism. Uh, there are three characteristics of the public's attitudes to Britain's membership of the EU, changeable, ignorant, and half-hearted. We were there 35, 40, getting on to 40 years ago when, uh, when he said that uh, at the time of the 1975 referendum. Uh, so what are the issues facing Britain? We haven't, done our, we haven't produced our April survey yet, so these are the most recent figures I've got. What do you see as the most important, other important issues facing Britain today? Immigrants. Immigration, 46%, up to since February. I'm looking forward to seeing what it is now. NHS, always a perennial top three. The economy, EU and Europe's at 23. I've seen it down at six in the past three or four years. Education, schools, housing, poverty, very low. 15, unemployment, very low. Defense and foreign affairs, terrorism, what 14, surprisingly, and pensions. We have had a lot of publicity, mostly in the financial press, on pensions lately. But those are, the, those are the issues. And you see, they haven't changed a whole lot. Hardly a statistical change in the whole lot over one month. But we'll look at this question as a very important indicator between now and the 23rd of June of what might or might not happen. Uh, issues facing Britain, the common market and Euro, you can see that back then, it was high. You had the 10 new states, a lot of publicity about that. France and Holland reject the ratification of the EU Constitution. Lowest score recorded at 1% uh, in May 2010. And going through to their highest score was in 2015. I don't have this updated on 2016. Uh, concern about the EU by subgroups. Overall, 23% concerned about Europe. You get to party support, the conservatives up at 42, but I'll come back to them in a minute. Not a big difference between urban and rural. 
at that level, given the sample size, you would need about a four percent difference, not six, to be statistically within statistical limits. Very much more a middle class rather than a working class. And since the uh, Brexits who want to get out are much more heavily in the working class by uh, the social class determined by the occupation of the head of households, nothing to do with money, uh, and you get three in ten there. And by age group, the older they get, the more concerned they are about it. And you get a lot of Brexits over there. And the power of the gray vote is four times the power of the youth vote because there are twice as many of us and we're twice as likely to vote. And that's been a truism for the last, I've been quoting it for at least 25 years. Concern by region, huge concern comparatively in Scotland and the Southeast compared to the Midlands. Uh, if Britain were to leave the U Union, trend since 77, on whether Britain should stay in or get out of the European Union, how would you vote? And Douglas Hurd, when he was uh, foreign secretary, said, why, if we paid attention to the opinion polls, we'd have been in and out of the European Union 10 times. But it's been as, uh, as get out 65-26 back in 80, a 40-point gap there, whereas it was uh, that uh, nearly the same gap there. It's been a lot closer, but at the moment, that is up in 15 and 16, and the most recent, 51.36. And that's not as good a chart as if you would eliminate the don't knows, because if you got one poll that's finding 6% don't knows and another finding 12, it's a little misleading if you don't eliminate them. And that's a statistical. So what are the benefits? Freedom to travel, study, and work. This was one of the two really key issues in 75 referendum when I was working for the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary and meeting every day with five members of the cabinet in the, ch the chair being Jim Callahan, the Prime Minister. And I found among the over 55s, the key mover of people's opinion or solidifier of people's opinion was no more European wars. And with the under 35s, it was freedom to travel study. The Euro uh, it is a worry and a negative, and waste of money is certainly a negative, but peace is very important and particularly important to the over, over 55s. Bureaucracy, democracy, et cetera, down there. Loss of cultural identity is very small, and economic prosperity is surprisingly small. And that's the difference <coughs> between the positive and uh, negative on that. Which of these options are your own preference? April 96 on the question of Britain and other member states of the European Union moving towards closer political and economic union, 24% were in favor of it. And then it's been 13, 12, 13, in other words, 13 plus or minus one. Britain's relationship with, with Europe remaining broadly the same as present, 24, that's gone up, whereas that's gone down from 24 to 13 or 12. Britain returning to being part of the economic community without political links. And a lot of the Brexits are saying we can have our cake and eat it too and are favoring that. And that's October 15, the last time that question was asked. And Britain leaving the European Union you know, altogether. One thing I told William Hague when he became leader of the Tory party was quit talking about Europe. It's not going to gain you any votes. And he banged away for four years on Europe and what I said to him was that, look, only 18% of the public think it's one of the two or three most important issues to uh, decide how you're going to vote. And if you look at, the, at where they're coming from, 12% are strongly in favor of getting out, 6% are strongly in favor of staying in, and the rest of them say, I don't care, or it's too complicated, or I don't know what the issues are or who, who's the European Union, or whatever. We're now into the end of March, uh, late in March, 19th to the 22nd of March. As you may know, the United Kingdom will have a referendum on its membership. 
European Union, 23rd of June this year, how will you vote on the question, should the United Kingdom remain a member or uh, leave the European Union? How would you be inclined to vote? All giving a voting intention. 49-41 with uh, 8% and 2%, so and plus and negligible there. And combining 9 and 10 and always, in, uh, always voting, you can see that the Brexits increase of marginally, but importantly, five points in the ratio, whereas this stays more or less the same, and they're coming out of the don't knows. Now, <coughs> about 85% will answer the question, and 15% will say they don't know in any kind of election sort of thing. Uh, women are three or four points more likely to say don't know or refuse. Uh, than men, or say they're not paying attention, uh, or they don't care, uh, and for the most part, don't knows, don't vote. The media, one of the big mistakes the media make is reporting heavily and headlining, uh, I can remember one headline, 23% don't know, right across the front of the Times, and uh, the turnout was only going to be 65% or thereabouts, so of the People who say they don't know, the vast majority didn't vote. Otherwise, you'd have an 85% turnout. And we don't have 85% turnouts in this country. It's not compulsory. And the only places you get 85% turnouts anywhere are Belgium and Australia, where they have uh, fines for you if you don't vote, compulsory voting. So who's voting to remain and leave? Conservatives, 47% leave, 44%. And yet it's the Conservative Party policy, Conservative government, I should say, policy to remain. Labor, they're really carrying their people, the Lib Dems, what few of them we've got left, and UKIP, of course, heavily to get out. That's their principal theme. Men and women, men more likely, level. And if it's going to succeed, it's going to succeed on the backs of the women. 18 to 34, overwhelmingly, two-thirds. The 75 election, by the way, was 67-33 to stay in on the day in June 1975. And in Scotland, it was 59-41. The nightmare scenario for everyone uh, who's thinking about this kind of stuff is that uh, Britain votes, England votes to, stay, to get out and the Scots vote to stay in. That would be uh, the end of the United Kingdom. 35 to 54, the swing group. 55's out. ABC one's 31, 61% compared to 35%. The head of the referendum, which the following outcomes do you think is most likely? Remain supporters, 77, but only a five point difference. You see it's uh, 40, uh, 64, yeah, 64% there among the Remain supporters. So much stronger in terms of thinking it's going to happen. The 77% compares with the bookies probability today of 73%, I think it is. It was 79, so, sorry, 71% a couple of days ago, and it was 69%. So the betting movement is to staying in, and heavily by more than two to one. Uh, let's see, yeah, definitely decided is going up and will go continue to go up right until Election Day. And it's been declining of those who may change their mind. Obviously, that's a reciprocal. And the don't knows are practically nothing. And, uh, oh God, I pulled those, I pulled these numbers out and now they've gone back. Uh, yeah, I did that just this morning, early this morning. Have they decided? Definitely decided, yes. But the leave and get out are, have an eight point lead and that's an indication that there'll be a stronger leave and get out, which is why I've changed my estimate of the outcome to 54, 40, 46, uh, dropping it just a swing of two points from uh, 56, 44. Conservatives, 5247, not much in it, but Labor and Lib Dem and UKIP are pretty firm 
in their conviction. So Cameron's got a lot of work to do in that group, some of whom may slide over into that group, of course, uh, and men 70 and women 57, as I indicated earlier. And the older you are, the more likely you are to be definitely decided and definitely uh, intending to vote. And here's the balance. I like this question. It goes back to 2015. I hope we update it this month. 29% uh, I strongly support. 13% I strongly oppose. So that's more than two to one. So that's changed considerably since the days of William Hague. They're generally in favor, and these two add up then to over 60, and these two are half that on a post. And who is important to decide? David Cameron, but then Boris Johnson, the mayor of London. Now, this was done in February. We haven't updated it. I think it's in the pipeline and will be uh, uh, printed out in the Evening Standard in a week or two uh, to update it. And I think his uh, uh, racial comment about uh, Kenyan parents, parents, yeah, uh, of Barack Obama, would be father of Kenyan origin is going to uh, is not going down well. It's not in the British nature to uh, the majority of the British to accept that kind of uh, slur. And then Theresa May and George Osborne equally, and then Jeremy Corbyn at 27 percent, and then the people uh, further down the line, with Farage making very little impact on anybody except UKIP supporters, and. Uh, what reforms? Well, those are the reforms, but it's, uh, I, think, I think we're whistling in the dark to think that uh, we're going to get much change out of the European Union, but that's what the public would like. And here's who they trust most. Television news, academics. I should have said that at lunch today. I was qu quizzed about that, and one or two of the people were saying they're not getting enough attention. Politicians come fairly low and celebrities are, are really nowhere uh, on that question. So we're back to Hugo Young and any questions and we've got 10 minutes if you want to use them. Sir. Thank you, Sir Robert. Getting a handle on public opinion in the approach to a general election is one thing. Getting a handle on public opinion in an approach to a referendum is another thing. Are there any significant differences that mean that and the one is more likely to be accurate than the other. And I, the reason I ask this question is at the time of the referendum on Scottish independence, there were quite a lot of comments in the press saying, well, of course, whatever the track record of the opinion pollsters in the past, it's a completely different ball game in a referendum and, and you can't expect them to, to be so, to get it right. The Any reason they that? say that is because about two thirds of the public are predetermined as to their support for a political party. And they don't change very much because they're based on core values rather than on issues. Core values being that's the way my parents voted, so I've been a, I'm an exception. I grew up in a Republican household in the States and I became a Democrat when I opened my eyes. You know, it's the, it's the, kitten, the kitten process. Uh, but at university and I studied political science and so you naturally move over and become active in, in my case. Um, but a referendum is diff very different than an opinion poll. It's a date certain. If you're going to vote, you make your decision probably fairly early on that you're going to vote and you start paying attention. In general elections, a lot of people don't pay attention because they already know. So that's why this uh, effort to focus on absolutely core individual marginal constituencies. And you can drive, the le there's many, many ep uh, people witnessing this. You drive from one constituency into the next constituency, into the third constituency, and the fourth. All the posters in the third constituency, all the activities, all the door knocking, all everything is happening in the third constituency because it's a it's a marginal constituency and I'm partly to blame for that because I was working for the Labor Party and for 19 years in the uh, 
1970s. I hastened to add, for the best of all capitalist reasons, they paid very well and promptly, and that was helpful with, with a small fledgling company and only a few people working on that account. So uh, referenda are unique, virtually. 1975, it certainly was unique. And we were able to forecast the uh, turnout very precisely. And we had within one point the result very precisely. And it's a bipolar decision. You, know, you, can't, you can't haver as to whether or not you're going to vote for the Liberal Democrats because he's a good constituency MP uh, in an ordinarily would-be Labor seat and you're a Labor Party supporter but you vote for him because he's done a good job for you know, getting your kid uh, out of trouble or something like that. So I think referendum ought to be easier. Referenda ought to be easier. Uh, but we'll see this time if it is. But we did well in Scotland. Our Scottish operation also got the SNP as I said, 56 out of the 59. One of the things that strikes me about this referendum, it might be a longer term process if we think about, if you think about well, Trump and all the rest of it. The, is, it, is there any difference the extent to which leading politicians just don't care if what they're telling you isn't true anymore? <laughs> the, the, the amount of political dissembling in both the Leave campaign and the Remain campaign seems to be on a different scale than that which we have seen at earlier points in history. It, it, we seem to be in the era of post-factual politics almost, where it just does not matter whether it's true or not, just say it, say it often enough, say it loud enough. Is that your sense too? And do, how does it impact upon your end of the operation and trying to read public, public opinion in light of that? Um, there are those. Uh, I wouldn't just pick out Boris Johnson, but it's the first name that comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just, you cannot believe what Boris Johnson is, you know, that he really believes some of that stuff. It's a Donald Trump effect. I'm, you know, friendly with Boris and know his father very, very well, Stanley, and know his brother Joe, who I think's the best by far in the family, because Boris is lazy and Boris will just say anything. And then on the other hand, you've got Cameron's advisor, Linton Crosby, talking, to, coming up with his dead cat theory. If uh, the opposition is making uh, a good point and it's getting publicity, you throw a dead cat on the table, whether or not it's, uh, uh, well, it was the other way around with, uh, well, no, no, actually Cameron tried to do that with uh, the Panama scandal, with uh, all the, fiddling that's going on, tax uh, evasion, not just avoidance, but evasion, and uh, Cameron's father's trust coming to light. And uh, William Hague was on any questions. Do you, do you all go listen to any questions? Friday night, Saturday lunchtime? When I was on the Fulbright Commission, I lectured the incoming U.S. people and the outgoing uh, Brits who were going to the States on uh, media in the two countries, because they're vastly different. And I would say to the Yanks, have you listened to the Today program this morning? Like three out of 20 or 25 would have listened to the Today program. I said, listen to the Today program for 15, 20 minutes every morning, because it's setting a political agenda for the day. And who listens to any questions? And any questions is so interesting and so informative about the issues of the day because uh, if you're on it, I've been on it several times, a number of times, uh, you're taught to read all the popular press because you know that some of those questions are going to come out of the popular press. The last time I was on but one, I, I prepared 20 index, 22 actually, index cards where I had the question and my answer, what my answer was going to be. I got three right and I missed the other two, just they weren't among the 22 questions that I was prepped for. And most of the people who were on it do that. There are very few people who wing it. And the same thing with question time. Yeah, I, I think they can, they think they can get away with it more. And I think the Linton Crosbys of this world are, are uh, throwing dead cats.
advising their clients to throw dead cats. And he's carrying a lot of weight these days, and I don't understand why. Uh, he's, after all, he was Michael Howard who brought him in, and Michael Howard didn't exactly uh, burn up the uh, burn up the road on the road to number 10. You were careful to say they think they can get away with it now. Can they? Is there any, is there any evidence to suggest that they're wrong, that they can get away with just saying things I for the I don't effect? know of any evidence that would give us that. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure there is. I'm not sure there is. Thank you.